Good morning, regular physics. We are in the middle of chapter six, chapter 6.3 B and C is what we're looking at today. Uh, yesterday you were assigned the lab 6.2 on friction and in the notes today, I will have an example to show you how to walk through solving that problem in case you're a little bit confused, which I wouldn't doubt because of the fact that there hadn't been any real explanation for it yet. That lab won't be due until the 21st the week after we get back from our, our October break, and when we also begin our live Zoom notes. All right, so let's get started here. Um, first of all, we need to go over chapter six, homework number three, questions 14 to 17. Calculate the kinetic friction for the rubber soled shoe on wet concrete. So if you take a rubber soled shoe and you pull with a force forward, and you pull it at a constant speed, then the friction force, you're moving it, so we're going to call it kinetic friction force, is equal and opposite to that forward force. We don't need to know that for this problem because the formula for friction is really all that we need to be able to do. F sub Fk in this case equals mu sub k times Fn. That's the other two forces that we see here is Fg and F sub uh, F sub N for the normal force. Okay. I will require you to do these pictures on the test. You'll be drawing free body diagrams and labeling the forces. So get used to this uh, pretty common uh, standard uh, free body diagram for a friction problem. Um, okay. So we're trying to calculate this friction force. So we need to know the mu, which is 0 0.40. And we need to know the Fn. Fn is equal and opposite to Fg as long as there's no funny business going on. Uh, when you're standing on a bathroom scale and it's not accelerating up or down, then your weight is the normal force. The scale reads the normal force, and the normal force would just be equal to 550 newtons in this case. So then we plug that into our calculator, and our calculator tells us 220 newtons is the answer. Question number 15, what is the coefficient of static friction for you, still 55 kilograms, in your rubber-soled shoes if the friction force required to get you sliding? is 350 newtons. Okay, so to get you sliding, somebody's gonna pull or push, and or maybe it's you just trying to push off the ground and that's when your foot slips because you push a little bit too hard against uh, uh, maybe a somewhat slippery surface. But in order for that to occur, you have to overcome static friction. Now it doesn't say that, and I'm not gonna grade if you call it F sub FK or F sub FS, but just know that in order to get you sliding, you're overcoming static friction. Once you are sliding, then it's kinetic friction. Uh, Fg and Fn. So what is the coefficient of friction? Means that we're solving for the mu. So the formula says F sub Fs equals mu sub S times Fn. F sub Fs is equal and opposite to the force to get you sliding. So I'm going to substitute in 350 newtons here. Then we're solving for the mu. And then I'm going to substitute in for Fn equal and opposite to Fg. So 550 newtons goes in here. Divide the 550 to the other side. That gets the mu all by itself. And you get 350 divided by 550. Comes out to be 0.64. Question number 16. A person pushes on a wooden crate on a wood floor, crate has a mass of 45 kilograms, and mu sub s equals 0.5. What force would be necessary to get the crate started moving? So let's figure out what the maximum static friction force is, and then we'll just say that this force has to be 0.1 newtons greater than that. So solving for the static friction force, we take the static friction coefficient, and we multiply that times Fn. Fn is equal and opposite to Fg. So if it's a 45 kilogram crate, it's a 450 Newton crate. Half of 450 is 225, I think. So we could say then that in order to get it moving, we need to push with a force of 225.1, right? Now on your test, you can just tell me that value. And that's good enough. But just know that we need to apply just a little bit more force than the maximum static friction force, and it gets moving. Question number 17, if we were doing lab in class, we would see your lab group weighing a block with a spring scale. So you lift it up the block to see what it weighs. It weighs nine Newtons. So if Fg equals nine Newtons, that means that Fn equals nine Newtons. 
The force required to move it at a constant speed across light sandpaper, this force is 15.5 newtons. And so if it's moving at a constant speed, these are the things you guys got to catch going into your test without being here in front of me in class where I can stress these things and look you in the eyes and make sure that you're hearing what I'm saying. You need to catch that in a constant speed situation that F and F sub K or F and F sub FK, the friction force and the force that somebody pulls with are equal and opposite. So I don't know, I might still want to do this as an F net equation. I know that's how I set them up in the notes. I think this is more valuable for us, especially as we move into today's notes. When it's moving at a constant speed, the F net is equal to zero, which means then as you uh, do the substitution of formulas in here, that we can see that if I substitute in, and let's maybe move this to the other side, right? If I subtract the other side, if both sides are negative, cancel out the negatives, then we can say F equals mu times fn but fn is equal and opposite to fg so really this formula and this formula are the same thing it's the substitution into the friction force formula of the forward force and the weight force substitutes in for f sub fk and fn so please make that connection very important connection if you want to be successful in chapter six 1.72, that's high. It's very rare that you see a mu that's greater than one. Um, but, and I'm guessing, you know, I made up these numbers. So probably this is bigger than it really would have been. All right, that brings us to today's notes. We got two sections to go over here, but just a couple of examples from each section, which is why I'm doing two at one time. Normally we'd be adding in a couple more examples because we'd be talking about our labs as well. Um, I will be talking about the lab when we get to the second part of this, the 6.3C. Uh, we'll talk about the lab that you were just assigned yesterday. All right. Example one is just like what we're, we're doing. Uh, this would be like my bowling ball. If I pulled the bowling ball across the table and I pull it at a constant speed. First of all, the forces here, you'd have to label these on a test. So don't expect to see them like this. You're going to have to label them. But we would say that the net force to pull something is the forward force that somebody pulls with minus the friction force that tries to resist that pulling. And if you're pulling at a constant speed, the F net equals zero, which means that the forward force of 15 newtons is equal and opposite to the friction force, mu times Fn. Okay. Then the substitution says that Fn is equal and opposite to Fg. If it's a six kilogram bowling ball, that means it's a 60 Newton bowling ball. So now we're at zero equals 15. Let's leave the units out now so that we don't have those confuse us when we do our division. You end up with that, okay? So see the substitution that occurred? These two numbers here substitute in for these two numbers here or two forces there. You can put those numbers in for them, all right? So now when you go to solve this, Maybe you move the 15 to the other side. And then to get the mu by itself, you divide both sides by 60. Or you get yourself a fancy TI Inspire and let it tell you the answer. You can just call that X. And you'd have 0 equals 15 minus X times 60. And it will tell you that it equals 0.25. Okay. That's example one. A lot like what you just did for homework last night. Only... Definitely setting it up as an F-net equation because I'm going to do that to you on the test. You're going to be required to write the forces in the free body diagram. You're going to be required to write an F-net equation, and you're going to be required to solve the F-net equation for something. We don't know which one of these things will end up being the variable, but solving for mu is a very common thing to, to do in these problems. Uh, when there is acceleration, a lot of times then it's the solving for the acceleration and the mu would be given in the problem. Question number two, uh, force of 2.5 newtons is required to get a 0.4 kilogram block sliding. A force of two newtons is required to keep it sliding. Okay, so notice that they give you two different forces here. There's really two different problems in one. So we have this block that's on the table. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to apply a force of 2.5 newtons to get it sliding. This is the static arrangement. Okay. Down here, once you get it moving, it doesn't require as much force. Hopefully you remember this kind of thought process from when I talked about it in the last notes. 
right? Static friction is greater than kinetic friction. Maybe I didn't talk enough about it in the last notes, but I know that at the end of this slide, there's a, a really good explanation online that I've added into the slides to explain how it works that these two forces aren't the same. Okay, so we have the, the static situation and the kinetic. As a test question, this will be two different parts. I will not mix it all together. I will uh, ask you about the static arrangement first, then I'll ask you about the kinetic arrangement afterward. I think we have an example like that coming up. Okay, so what do we know? We know that to get it moving means that you had to apply a force that was just a little bit more than the static friction force. Okay? Meanwhile, the object has weight and it has normal force. We need those because that's a substitution in the problem. I can do the same thing down here in the kinetic situation. That instead, this would be the kinetic friction force. Object still has weight, same weight, and same normal force. The only thing that's changed is these two forces are shorter than the two in part A, because to get it moving takes more force. Once it's moving, it takes less force. So this should be something that, that is reasonable to you. You recognize from real life that sometimes it's just harder to get something sliding. You want to move your bed in your bedroom. And as you go and pull on it, it takes a lot of force. But once you can keep it moving, it doesn't take as much force to keep sliding it across the carpet to get it over to where you want it. All right. So in the top part, we're doing the same thing that we've been doing since the homework assignment. Um, that maybe if I, I could still write this as an F net. I'm not going to. I'm just going to put that the forward force has to equal the maximum static friction force. Remember that static friction force varies between zero and a maximum value. As long as you're exerting a force less than its maximum value, it's not moving and the static friction equals your force. Until you exert a force that's greater, 2.5 newtons is finally greater, then you're gonna get it to move. There's our formula. And we're gonna plug in that, uh, we're solving for the mu's. So, 2.5 equals mu sub s times fn. fn is equal and opposite to fg. It's a 0.4 kilogram block, 4 newtons. Divide mu sub s equals 0.63. Okay, so that's the mu sub s. Now, once it starts move, moving, mu sub s goes away. The, the static friction force goes away. Now it's kinetic friction that takes over. So in order to keep it moving, now, I'm still going to do this as an F net because that will be more beneficial for us for future problems. F minus F sub FK. It's moving at constant speed. F net equals zero. We move it with a force of two. And then mu sub K. Oops, I'm trying to put mu sub F. I don't know where that came from. Mu sub K times Fn. Fn is still equal and opposite to Fg. It's still four. So we've got two minus mu sub K times four. And then now you're going to solve for the mu sub k. So you subtract the 2 to the other side, divide both sides by 4. We get that mu sub k equals 0.5 as opposed to 0.63 for the mu sub s. So why is it that the static friction force is greater than the kinetic friction force? It's really tied up in a little bit of chemistry and also with uh, electromagnetism in physics. The idea that when the block, or in this case a block, is sitting on the surface and it's not moving, the electrons in the surface of the, of the two surfaces are repelling each other, but they're also exchanging back and forth. As they exchange back and forth, that's a slight bond. And so just like we learned in chemistry with breaking chemical bonds, you have to break this static bond between the two surfaces. And it's almost like static cling, only you wouldn't notice it like you would with a balloon in your clothing because of the fact that it's heavier objects and less amounts, but it's there. So there's a static cling that's there. Once you break that static cling, then the amount of static cling lessens, but there still is a little bit. And so therefore, then we have less static cling while something's moving across another surface than we do when they're just sitting there still relative to each other. Okay? Example three. <laughs> A person pushes a crate of 20 kilograms with a force of 101 newtons. Uh, mu sub s equals 0.5. So the first question is, will the crate move? All right, so if this was a test question, and you know what? Let's just label this, because this is exactly what I want for a test question. So you should label that in your notes that you know to look to this slide. Oops, if I can spell question. 
look to this slide for practice for your test. Okay, so first thing we can say about this is that we always know that every object has weight and that equal and opposite that is Fn if it's sitting on the floor. Now, you're going to exert a force, a force of 101 newtons. You want to get this moving. So the question is, how big is the maximum static friction force? Now, what I'm going to do on the test is I'm not going to say that will the crate move. I'm going to tell you that yes, the crate moves. I want you to prove that it moves by showing me that the F is greater than the static friction force. Okay, so I won't ask you will the crate move. I'm going to say to you, prove to me that the crate moves. Prove to me that 101 is larger than the maximum static friction force um, mu times Fn. All right. So Fn equal and opposite to Fg. So if it's a 20 kilogram mass, then that means it's a 200 newton weight. And that means the normal force is 200 newtons as long as there's no funny business. Then mu sub s is 0.5. Multiplying 0.5 times 200, we get 100. So since 101 is greater than 100, we can say, check mark, yes, it moves. Okay, so something on your test like that, that just shows me that you see that it moves because the force that's being applied is greater than the static friction force. Okay, then once it's moving, back to the same question we've already been answering, what force is necessary excuse me, with the hiccups, to keep it moving. Okay, so free body diagram still looks the same. The only difference is, is now it requires less force to keep it moving. We want to know what it is. Now, uh, it should say, sorry, hiccups still. It should say what force is needed to keep it moving at constant speed, because that's what it will say on your chapter test. And that means that we want to know what force is equal and opposite to F sub FK. So that's where I start making an F-net equation. Really won't need the F-net equation until we get down to part C, and then I will require it on your test. I might not even ask the part B of this. I probably will skip right from free body diagram, prove that it moves, what's its acceleration once it's moving, and I'll give you a mu sub k instead. I might ask an intermediate question like this says, what is the uh, kinetic friction force? Just that you could solve for F sub FK. Um, we'll see exactly how it goes, but it will be very similar to this problem here. F net equals zero because we're going to just move it at constant speed. We want to know what force and then mu sub k times Fn. So in other words, F equals whatever mu sub k times Fn is, which is 0.2 times still the same 200 newtons of weight is 200 newtons of normal force. 0.2 times 200 is 40 newtons. So that's all that's required to keep it moving at constant speed. It dropped from being 100 newtons down to 40 newtons to keep it moving at constant speed. That's quite a change. They don't usually change by that much, but remember, this is just a made up problem from the textbook. So now here's where we get into the F net equation. If somebody keeps applying a forward force of 101 newtons, and it only requires 40 newtons to keep it moving. Let's draw a picture for this one too. It can't hurt us when we're studying to see this, what's going on here. Fg is still 200 newtons, which means that Fn is still 200 newtons. But somebody's applying a force of F equals 101. And all that's required to keep it moving though is a friction force that's equal to 40, right? For the friction force equaled the forward force from part B. So if that's the case, we have an unbalance of forces here. So we would say then that F net equals the forward force minus the friction force. Same thing as what I wrote up here. The difference is instead of putting in zero, I'm now going to put in M times A because of an unbalance of force means there's going to be acceleration. The mass that we're accelerating is the 20 kilogram mass, 20 times A equals 101 minus 40, I believe that's 61, and then solve for A and we get something around three. I guess I had slides that solved this all the way out. And I believe there's a bunch of text boxes too online so that you can see exactly how that works out. Okay, that was section uh, 6.3B. It really was just uh, 
small step. I mean, I shouldn't say it's a small step, but it's a step forward from section A, just kind of combining it together and making these FNET equations a little bit more often. And then section 6.3 C uh, begins with, if you're looking at this online, it talks about lab stuff. And it even says, disregard this if we're at distance learning, because when I wrote these notes this summer, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. Um, but here we are. So we're on distance learning. So that lab is out. And the lab that we have is going to be our second, second example in these notes. This is a lab that we would have been doing in class. It's a great lab um, because what we can do is we can use, um, we, well, we could use mo motion equations, but what we try to do instead is we try to make a situation. Here's a better picture of this. So this is exactly the same thing, but then I took a picture offline. This is how they look on the AP test. In fact, this is probably taken from an AP test. If you've got a mass that's on the table, probably it's a large mass and it's on a rough surface. It doesn't have to be. This table's pretty smooth. And then you have a really small mass that's hanging off the edge of the table. It would be possible to have a situation where if you just kind of gave mass one a little bit of a push just, just to overcome static friction, that with the lesser kinetic friction, mass two would be just the right amount to fall at a constant speed and pull mass one forward at a constant speed. And we could use that to figure out some stuff, okay? In this case, we want to know what is the mass to that would make this move at a constant speed, all right? Expect this question on your test. So let's put this one too. Test question. You have a difficult test only if you're not following along. If you're following along, this shouldn't be too bad because you're just going to copy what it is that you're doing like these notes go to. All right, so I'm going to ask you on the test, part A, Draw the free body diagram. Part B, write the FNET equation. And then part C, solve. Okay, I'm not going to say solve for what, because it all depends on which form of the test you get as to what you're going to solve for. You might solve for mass 2. You might solve for mass 1. You might solve for the coefficient of friction. So it really all depends. All of that's fair game, and it would all be the same it's just where you, what you're solving for when you get to the algebra of it. The free body diagram always looks the same. You have an FG, but the other problem here is we have another FG. So what we'll do in order to give them different names is we'll call this one FG2, and we'll call this one FG1 since they're called mass one and mass two. If you don't do that on your test, I don't mark that wrong. I'll know what FG is what FG based on what you do with it, where you put it in the picture, and then what you do with it in the FNET equation matters also. In fact, while I'm on that subject, I'm going to change this FG1 to a different color. I'm going to make it green instead. You'll see why in just a moment. Okay, now, in what we learned from Chapter 5 is if mass 2, if we cut this rope, mass 2 would just free fall to the ground. That would be the only force on it. And so its acceleration would be 9.8 meters per second squared. But according to this problem, it's moving at a constant speed which means that something is stopping it from free falling, right? Now it's not somebody holding it up. There's no normal force here. There's nothing underneath this, right? It's still above the ground. I mean, it doesn't look like it's very high above the ground, but let's pretend it's a meter still down to where the floor is. So nothing's holding it from down below, but something is holding it from up above. And we already learned this from the first section. That's called a tension force when a rope or a string uh, or a cable holds something up, okay? That's your tension force. Now, if it's moving at a constant speed, what I know is that those two forces are equal and opposite to each other. Okay. All right. Now, I just want to point out here that we're going to have a section later in this chapter that deals with these types of problems. They're called coupled motion. So you're going to be learning all about this later. Right now, we're getting kind of a, a look ahead because of the fact that we can use friction in these problems as a, as a practice. So this is a big deal but it's going to be practiced more towards the end of the chapter so that we can, you know, get, be more uh, accustomed to it. Okay. All right. Now here's the thing about coupled motion, whatever tension is established in the rope over here where mass two is attached, that same tension force is exerted over the entire rope. So it's that same tension force that pulls forward on mass one on the table. Okay. Now if mass one is moving across the tabletop at a constant speed, then that tells us that the friction force is also equal to that. And since they're moving, we'll call it F sub FK. All right. Now, one more force I need to put in here 
is my FN. I didn't really leave myself enough room for the top of this page, but that'll work. There's your FN. Now, the reason why FN and FG are in a different color is because they don't get to go into the FNet equation. The FNet equation is written where it shows how something moves. So now here's where you have to be listening. So I'm going to draw some stuff on the picture and then I'm going to erase it because I don't want this getting in the way of our drawing. Mass 2 is moving this way. So in terms of the FNet equation, we would say that FNet equals mass 2's weight minus attention force. Okay, But that's not the end of the problem because then the pulley has mass two attached to mass one on the tabletop. So mass one is moving this way. So while mass one moves right to left or left to right, mass two moves up to down, but they are tied to each other by that rope. So the pulley, what it did is it just changed the direction of the forces. Okay, so Try to get rid of that other red. There it is. So now this tension force tried to stop mass two from moving downward. This tension force is pointing really, if you kind of, could you take this mass two and move it upward so that this was one horizontal picture? This tension force and this tension force are pointing opposite directions. That makes the second tension force up here on the table a positive, wrong color, a positive tension force. Now, please keep in mind, this is way ahead of schedule. So if you're sitting there going over this one, I don't understand what he's talking about. We're going to get more practice of this at the end of the chapter. Right now, we're just doing this because of the friction force that's here, which is also opposing the motion. Okay. Now, what we're going to learn later at the end of this chapter is even those two tension forces are in the FNet equation, they actually cancel each other out because one's positive, one's negative, and they're equal to each other. So they actually leave the FNet equation. And if the object's moving at a constant speed, F net equals zero, it's supposed to be in blue, equals FG2. That's actually what we're trying to find. Mass two times gravity minus F sub FK, mu sub K times FN. Please don't freak out. This is a lab question. We would be going over this together in order to solve the lab problem that you would have just done as your lab the previous day. So this is really ahead of schedule in terms of where it fits into the chapter, but it's not a bad little heads up, kind of help us see what's going on here. All right, Fn is equal and opposite to Fg1. Fg1 is a 0 0.250 kilogram. So how about 2.5 newtons as a weight? Mu sub K, 0.55. And then over here, we've got gravity. And we've got mass two. Normally, like we did with this one, you would take the mass times gravity and 0.25 becomes 2.5. Here we can't do that because we don't know what mass two is yet. So we have to just put in times 9.8. And now we go through the steps of solving that out. Okay, please don't freak out about this. That was a difficult set of things. One other thing I didn't mention about this, I think it talks about this on the slides really well though, is notice that I did not move. I did not put the FN or the FG1 into the free into the FNet equation because of the fact that if the mass is moving on the table this direction, those forces are perpendicular to that and they're not contributing to the acceleration. We know they're contributing to a formula for friction, so they have to be there, but they don't get to go in the FNet equation. We'll explain that better as we get to the end of the chapter. Okay, anyway, the solving out, look at how this. I did it a little bit different online. I'm not going to go through the explanation of that because it is a little bit early, but it still would be the same answer that you're still just doing in the end 0.55 times 2.5. Uh, that would be the force. And then, oops, wrong way. And then I just divided out the 9.8 in order to get that answer. So if you're looking at this online, that might be a little bit confusing there. I think it's better if you just look at what I did here. And still, if you're confused, remember, this is just a head start, head start towards later on in the chapter. Let's get into our lab so we can call it a day. So what you're going to do that your lab that was posted yesterday is that you are going to roll a ball or you're going to slide an object across a table. In either case, it's going to look just like this. Okay. Now, here's what we know about this problem. And I like what I did online better because this is too small of a picture. This ball is going to roll until here it comes to a stop. Okay. When it comes to a stop, we know that its final speed is zero. 
Our problem though is we don't know its initial speed, but we know how far it rolled or how far the block slid because you measured that and you also measured the time. So what I have you do in the first step of this is use the equation distance equals one half VI plus VF times T and solve for what VI is. So in my problem here, I'd be plugging in 5.5 for the distance equals one half of VI plus zero times three. And then I'm gonna solve for what VI is. The reason that I need to do that, mine came out to be 3.7. The reason that I need to do that is because I wanna find the acceleration because here's our situation with this ball or this block, depending on what you did. Every object has gravity. And if it's on the floor, it's got normal force, okay? When it's moving, once it released from your hand, there's no longer a forward force. All there is is friction trying to bring it to a stop. We'll call it kinetic friction. If it's rolling, it's actually a rolling friction. So you call it S of F R, leave it as K because it's moving. We want to just have K for moving, S for not moving, okay? So now if I want to know what this friction force is, my problem is, is I need to be able to, I'm going to write an F net on that, which I believe is part three. Yeah. So in part three, I want to say that F net equals the only force that's present, which is the friction force. Now I know there's Fn and Fg present, but they're not in the direction that the object's moving, right? The object is moving this way, just like this picture shows with the black arrows, and it's coming to a stop somewhere out here. In my case, 5.5 meters down the road. So if it's moving horizontally, vertical forces don't get to go in the F net equation. Can you remember that statement? Things that move horizontally, the vertical forces don't go in the F net equation. All right. So to get to this point where I want to have M times A equals the friction force, I need to know what A is. So in order to get A, I need to define that from motion variables and the ones that we have here don't solve that. So I had to solve for VI first. Once I have VI, then I can use the equation that says VIT plus one half AT squared would be a way for us to figure out A. Uh, I might not have done that on, your, on yours. I probably used the easier equation. Let's see what I used here. I did, I used an easier equation. This will work, but that's more work. What's less work is to use VF equals VI plus AT. No squaring stuff, not a whole bunch of terms. So now we can say zero equals 3.7 plus A times three seconds and solve for A. Now, of course, you're plugging in your own values. When you do that, my calculator said negative 1.23. And yes, it should be negative. The reason why it needs to be negative is because now we're going to take this acceleration and we're going to put it into the F net equation to find out what the friction force is. Okay, so our F net equation says the only force that's present in the horizontal direction is working against the movement, it's friction, and then mass. Okay, so now for your lab, you guys don't have the mass. So this is something that changes from the in-class problem to the at-home problem is the fact that you guys don't have scales necessarily to measure the mass of something so small. You can't put a ball on a bathroom scale and expect to get a reading. So let's leave this as M times A. And then really what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine uh, steps three and four together right now. And I know I explained this on the lab write-up, but sometimes it's nice to hear this talked about as well. So M times A equals the formula for friction, which is negative mu times Fn. Okay, now Fn is equal and opposite to Fg. Fg has the formula, you learn the first day of these notes, mass times gravity. So what if I took mass times gravity and substituted in for Fn? I would then be saying M times negative 1.23 equals negative mu sub k times M times G. Algebraically, mass is found on both sides of this equation, it cancels out. Also algebraically, a uh, negative sign is found on both sides of the equation. It cancels out. So where we're at now is 1.23 equals mu sub k times either 9.8 or 10. I don't care which one you use. And now we solve for mu sub k. So if you see this online on the notes, you see it slightly different because I knew the mass of my tennis ball. 
but I don't know the mass at the at home lab. So therefore it makes it easier if we just do it here this way. In this case, it still comes out to be the same answer as the mass canceled out 0.123 as my mean. So follow that or do it ahead of time and send me questions and I will help you out with solving this out. But I do believe that is the end. All right. Next time we do notes, it'll be in a Zoom.